uh, message is finding success. Finding success in your job and career. Finding success in your job and career. Although written centuries ago, the Bible contains time-tested and proven principles for success in uh, your jobs and your career. Today, I wish to share a few key principles. Although my primary focus is the youth of the church here, God's God-inspired word applies to all of us, whatever age we are at. In a world that has changed so much in recent years, jobs and careers have also changed. The world's technological advancements and economic situations have led for this to happen. Not long ago, it was common for a man to have one job in his entire life. His seniority, his experience was all, and he probably hung on to that as he hung on to dear life. And employee was happy, employee is happy. That is long gone now. The world has changed from a single job to guys and girls who have various experiences in various industries and people who are motivated to contribute to the company's progress as well as their own progress. How we looked at jobs before is something of the past. Your ex qualifications and experience didn't will not provide job security anymore. It is common uh, for people to have several employees working, sorry, employers during a lifetime now because many skills are required to perform today. And as we and I learn, many of us are learning new things as uh, older people. Uh, learning a lot from the younger generation. Today in this world, uh, some of you are not familiar with this term, but companies are joining together. They are called mergers. Companies are being bought over. They are called acquisitions. And companies and some products are getting redundant in the world. Who wants telegrams anymore? Who wants uh, faxes anymore? Those things are of the past. And things have changed, but as a result, it has thrown people out of their jobs if they stuck or hung on to this old traditional way of thinking and working. Long years ago, people were versatile. Versatile meaning brother, they can adapt to different situations instantly. Why do I say people were versatile 2000 years ago? Because a man in the home knew how to grow. He also knew how to repair his boat or repair his uh, agricultural equipment. He didn't go to the market and buy a new tool the moment his one uh, moment his tool broke. In other words, he was able to even repair his own tools, manufacture his own tools, and live a, uh, a life uh, being versatile. In other words, a jack of all trades kind of person. Today, there is a throwaway society. You and I, maybe not all of us, maybe not every one of us, but we'll want to throw some broken item and uh, buy a new one instead of repairing it because we don't have the knowledge and we're not very really interested to find out knowledge. Not all, again. So self-employment, as in the past, is also good today. You and I, okay, many of many of you are involved in self-employed uh, 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 projects, and that that is also good. That doesn't allow you, therefore, to stick around with your same old product, talking of the same old thing. You and I need to be versatile. They say the only permanent thing in this world is change. In other words, the thing that continues to keep happening is changing. What we think of is uh, uh, is uh, technology today is not the technology uh, or the product tomorrow. Please turn with me to the book of Proverbs. The book of Proverbs gives us most of the insight that we need to learn and acquire if we are to be skillful workers and progress in our own uh, jobs and careers. As I told you at the beginning, 
thousands of years ago, Solomon wrote these things. They are never, ever outdated. Let's start by learning uh, the beginning of the book of Proverbs. Please turn to Proverbs chapter 1. Let's read, read verses 1 to 5. The Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to pursue the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, judgment, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, to the young man knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and increase learning, and a man of understanding will attain wise counsel. There's a lot packed in there, but you and I want to learn wisdom. We ask God, and he says, just peeping to the book of Proverbs, the wisdom he gave Solomon to share with us. There are hundreds of observation advice, all aspects of life in the book of Proverbs, but there is much God wants to share with us in terms of jobs and career. The man Solomon, you and I have read, son of David, and he asked one thing from God, he asked for wisdom. And if you, if you find out uh, what Solomon did, let's read 1 Kings chapter 4. This is a bit of a, a few lines about Solomon. And just compare ourselves with Solomon to see whether we are also thinking and acting or trying to be something like this, a son of God. 1 Kings chapter 4, verses 30 to 34. Solomon, as you know, was a multi-talented man. He was not only a gifted writer and a teacher, he composed music. He's a student of nature. He understood how animals behave. First Kings chapter 4, verses 30 to 34. Thus, Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the men of the East and all the wisdom of Egypt. Verse 31. For he was wiser than all men, than Eden the Israelite, and Hermon, Chalcol and Dada, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the surrounding nations. He is talking about his wisdom, how smarter he was than most of these big names that are mentioned here, and of the people who lived that time in the East there. He spoke 3,000 proverbs, and his songs were 1,005. Also, he spoke of trees from the cedar tree of Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, of birds, of creeping things, and of fish. And men of all nations from all the kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom came to hear the wisdom of Solomon. So, the wisdom that God is sharing to you and me is coming through this man. This man who was so versatile, he not only honored and worshipped God, until he ruined himself, but a man who was a, a, a student, a student of everything. Imagine if you write 1,005 songs, write 3,000 prose, how much you must be focused and uh, uh, well-versed. So that is Solomon, and here is where he begins. He talks about the end. We started reading the book of Proverbs, chapter 6. Of course, you're there already. Book of Proverbs, chapter 6. Let us read verse 6 to 11. And see how he uses the end to teach us how to do our jobs. Proverbs, chapter 6, verse 6 to 11. Go to the end, you sluggard. Sluggard is a lazy person. Consider her ways and be wise. He said, have a look at the end. And learn wisdom from the end, which having no captain, overseer, or ruler, provides her, provides her supplies in the summer and gathers the food in the harvest. How long will you slumber, O sluggard? Will you rise from your sleep? When will you rise from the sleep? A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep. So shall your poverty come on you like a prowler, and your need like an armed man. There's a few things he's discussing in this list. Summarize it in a point form. 
He says, look at the end and here are the lessons. First lesson, he says, the end does not have someone to tell it what to do. The end doesn't have someone. There is no ruler, no leader. Therefore, what does it do to us today? What does it say to us? It tells us that we need to be looking into ourselves to see what, is, what needs to be done to take care of matters of life. Whether on any supervisor in your company will value such a person who is learning on his job and doesn't have to be reminded and told what to do. Those who must constantly be told what to do are rarely successful because they only drain the time and energy of their managers. Just imagine someone telling you, oh, Frank, do this and Frank, do that. And you come tomorrow, Frank, can you do this and do that? And after a while, you, the supervisor is going to get be disgusted. And your progress is gone from there onwards. No initiative, no potential, no ideas. You're just there to uh, pass the time. So, from the end, we learn how to find education, how to find knowledge and wisdom and acquire that and apply that into our lives and being uh, enterprising. A second point, the end teaches us to prepare for the future. When the opportunity was there to gather food, that's when the end got it and stored it in his barns. He didn't wait for the rainy season to come because he knew he was going to starve. So he stocked the provisions well ahead of time. Just remembering that, brethren, I think long months ago, we distributed foods. We reminded you to have new stocks in hand. I hope you're not forgotten. We don't know what moment anything can happen in our country. Don't take, be taken by surprise. Be like the end. Have those things stand by on a continuous basis. Likewise, we should recognize the need to prepare for the future, just like the end. He thought about the future, he food, food is going to be scarce, so he had something in his barns. Opportunities don't present to don't present themselves always to us, brethren. They don't. You have to be ready to grab the opportunity when it is presented. I remember defining luck. He says, luck is when preparation meets opportunity. It does not come your way through a swift ticket. We have to be ready. We have to prepare ourselves, therefore. Save while you earn. Don't be a spendthrift, busting all you have to match up with your rich friends and society. Prepare a budget and try and stick to it as best as you could. Try not to match up to the Joneses. <laughs> now, my mother was a Jones, but she was very poor. <laughs> the Joneses that uh, people usually use in the vocabulary, the rich people. Don't try to be like the rich person if you're not in a position to be that way. So, the ant teaches us be careful, save for the rainy day. Third point the ant teaches us the value of hard work. Brother Solomon's meditation and, and his and about the ant's behavior is unmistakable. To be successful, hard work is a must. Hard work. Today we call it hard work, just not hard work, just smart work. The ant seems in, instinctively to know it must work hard to survive. Too many people are yet to figure that out. No one wants to hire and keep a lazy person. If you're, you are not dependable in your company, before long, you will be noted and you will be sent out. Many of you have seen people go off overnight, just like that. For a little while, you can play around. But if you don't contribute through your hard work, then very, uh, it could be a risk, huge risk you are taking. Suffering and poverty as a result will come should you lose your job. A fourth point. He also mentioned the consequences of a lazy person. Proverbs 26 verse 16. Proverbs 26 verse 16. 
the lazy man is wiser in his own eyes than seven men who can answer sensibly. Because everyone gives excuses. Nobody wants excuses in an organization. If they give you a job to be done, they want it delivered. They want it professionally completed and, and delivered. Or else you'll be marked for uh, being lazy and insensible to what you promised to do when you join the company. Again, I will read Proverbs 24, verse 32, 34. I will be reading a lot of Proverbs before I move on to advice from Paul and then finally Jesus Christ. Proverbs 24, verse 32, 34. It is all about laziness. I went by the field of a lazy man and by the vineyard of a man devoid of understanding. 31, Proverbs 24, verse 31. And there it was all overgrown with thorns. Its surface was covered with nettles. Its stone wall was broken down. When I saw it, I considered it well. I looked on it and received instruction. Again, the famous words, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. So shall your poverty come like a prowler and your need like an armed man. Who is a prowler? Who, who is an armed man? Prowler is someone who waits to catch you un, unexpectedly. To even uh, probably even can uh, physically damage you or rob you or anything like. That. He says your need, your your need that you the needs you want in life will suddenly turn up if you are not working hard. So don't be lazy. In Proverbs twenty. In, Proverbs chapter 14, verse 23. In Proverbs 14, verse 23. Here is the focus still about the end and about the hard work of the end. And Proverbs says, look at the end and be wise. Proverbs 20, 14, verse 23. In all labor there is profit, but idle chatter leads only to poverty. Idle chatter. Many of us were at the office, <laughs> the immigration, immigration, we saw how we were in the long queue whilst four or five people uh, having idle chatter. In a private company, it would have been sacked, but unfortunately in the government, you and I pay their salaries <laughs> diligently by paying our taxes. This, uh, another version uh, called the Bible in basic English called the BBE. Same verse, slightly put differently. In all hard work, there is profit, but talk only makes a man poor. Brethren, Good ideas are just good ideas until you implement them. So giving good ideas to anyone does not help very much. You've got to find a ways and means of putting those ideas into practice. So good intentions are just good intentions. It doesn't produce anything. Therefore, always remember, because of social media, many, even in the private organization where I have worked also, is idle chatter. How? Facebook. Is that what you are paid for? Think away. Just, just for your reference, you can write it down for Proverbs 13. I'll read it for you. You don't need to go there. The soul of a lazy man desires and has nothing, but the soul of the diligent shall be made rich. You want to be rich spiritually? Then you will do what God has to say. You want to be rich financially? Then God still has something to say. Hard work is the key thing. Laziness is not. Of course, uh, we are all uh, one of us. Maybe at times I would run it when I was employed too. Finding excuses is like what Proverbs 22.30 has to say. The lazy man says, there's a lion outside. I shall be sl slain in the streets. A lot of people use excuses during COVID time. Giving excuses just to get away from uh, work. Even when you're at home, not doing your job properly, even online. All excuses, internet's on, off, 
that is not working, this is not working, and they couldn't find out. So you've been doing exactly that is uh, <laughs> exactly what uh, Solomon wrote in 2213. There's a line outside. I shall be slain, and I, I can't do anything about this. So excuses will also not do. Therefore, diligence and hard work are the opposite side of, of what you call laziness. What is diligence? Diligence is the what you call initiating. You, you think and you come up with ideas. You are motivated to produce those ideas. You are enthusiastic to see the job being done. You have drive, you have foresight, and you have curiosity. That's what the word really from Hebrew gets translated to diligence is that is just being sharp. Being sharp is so, so important today. We refer to someone as sharp if we think he's intelligent or productive or effective, right? So in other words, you and I must be also diligent. Probs 12 verse 24. Let's go there. Probs 12 verse 24. Proverbs 12, verse 24. The hand of the legion will rule, but the lazy man will be put to forced labor. The hand of the legion will rule. What does that mean? If you are enthusiastic, if you are motivated, and if you are producing the good results, your promotions and advancements, advancements are always going to be there. Or you will be left behind by the rest. And then you will grumble, and they will still punish you, and then you lose your job. Brethren, if you want to be considered, especially I'm talking to the youth again, you want to be considered for opportunities of advancement, cultivate and develop these traits that we discussed. Do your absolute best in your position now if you are looking for a higher position in time to come. In other words, as I have said before, act in a manner that you want to become. In other words, if you are if you are eyeing at the next level in your in your job, act and behave that way right now in your present job. If you, want, if you are a manager and you want to be a senior manager, begin to think and act in your present job as a manager, all, although you are not the senior manager. That way, your thinking will be sharp and you'll be motivated and you will educate yourself so that you will rise up to that position. No one is interested in passive people. Passive people are guys who are just interested. What you're saying, I will do. Passive, nothing, not, nothing coming up from him. Uh, not interested in their work. Just getting their salaries and uh, going home. Don't want to take additional responsibilities. That's where you get tested. First, they give you the responsibility to see whether you are de you are deserving of the increase. You're deserving of the extra salary that your employer wants to give us. Doesn't matter what job you do, Ecclesiastes 9, verse 10, you are thoroughly uh, familiar with that. You don't need to go there. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your mind. And there is no or device or knowledge or wisdom in the grave where you are going. Right now, as you and I live, whatever we find to do, whether it is our job, whether it is our education, whether it is our service to God, whether it is to sing, to praise, to teach, whatever, do it as best as you could. Because the best opportunities, brethren, you will have is only if you can apply these principles in your job. Proverbs 22, verse 29. It's good if you can go there. Proverbs 22, verse 29. Do you see a man who excels in his work? He will stand before kings. He will sta not stand before unknown men. You want to progress in life. You want to go places. You better excel in your work right now. If you excel in your work now, the, you also poise to see the opportunity for you to excel in a higher, higher position. And the assurance is, what Solomon said, you won't be ordinary anymore. You will stand before kings. 
who is the example? Daniel. He was smart. He was intelligent. Daniel had faith and honored God. He was able to do a lot of things at that time in his day and age. A young man, just like some of you in his age. Another point, brother, I want to talk about is preparation before pleasure. Preparation before pleasure. For young people in particular, Solomon offers advice that becomes understandable when we apply the underlying principles he's talking about day in, day out. Proverbs 24, verse 27. Proverbs 24, verse 27. Solomon here, thousands of years ago, was summing up a crucial principle for you and I today. Remember, it was an agricultural society then. If you plowed your field, you got produce. If not, you could even starve. That's it. You couldn't have gone and, unless you keep borrowing, but people don't give you. Remember when he said, prepare your outside work. Make it fit for yourself in the field. And afterward, build your house. Sounding very old-fashioned, how will this be applicable to us today? I told you about a society then, which was agricultural. If you didn't prepare a field, you got no fruit, no wheat, no rice, no whatever. As simple as that. Does it apply to us today? Of course. What is the advice? Get your fields ready. Get your foundations done properly. Prepare yourself for this future. Take steps that will put you and keep you or help you bring food to your table. That's the beginning. Bring food to the table. Get your basics done. Educate yourself. Go to school. All right, Jay? Yes. Let's <laughs> see. Uh, and then we'll talk about the future, he says. And what is the future? After that, build your house. What is building house? Do you think he's talking about a house and a foundation? No, he's talking of the principles that are required even to build a house. Get the foundation ready or a house will fall down. So get your foundations ready. You want to be somebody somewhere as you live in this world. You want a career. If that stays, prepare for it now. That's what he's saying. Get your basics first done. And then you will be prepared. He's talking about priorities in life. What if you have, for instance, uh, you want to buy a car, but you don't have even a job. If you like to have, everybody likes a car. But what if you don't have the money to buy a car? You don't have the money to buy a car because you don't earn. You don't earn because you don't have a job. You don't have a job because you have not prepared to accept that job. Now, everything is not about being employed somewhere in another company. We have bankers here. We have IT professionals here, accountants. We have also mechanical people, people who can uh, do various things. Whatever your hand finds to do, do it all your mind things. If you are a mechanic, be the best that is available. If there was any opportunity that I could change my profession, I was telling uh, Jaden once, I'll become a mechanic. It's too late for that for me now. But if there was an opportunity I have to change my mind, if I give, allow rewinding, that's what I'll do. It will help me uh, in better ways than this. It being accountancy help me now. So the modern equivalent would be to be sure you are well prepared to make a living before you start trying to enjoy a good life. Put in the hard work, brother, that is necessary. So build a to build a career, to have good paying jobs. That is when your fields have been re made ready. After that, use those skills to make the house. It is the house, a home, marriage, success, this and that, that you can add to that. That is what he's saying. First, don't look at the pleasure. Look at 
the work and the foundation that you need to have pleasure later on. I should always tell my son long years ago, I said, you can continue to be happy if only you can go through these hard times of education in the, at the beginning. I would ask someone, young man, do you want to go in a bus four years or 40 years? You decide. What am I saying? There is sacrifice, there is hard work, and there is difficulties at the beginning. But when that's done, that's it. You, the next 40 years is going to be good for you guys. So the, in our time, the key that preparation is very, very important. If you want to lead a good life, educate yourselves. Again, education is not going to university, is not passing exams. Education is applying knowledge rightly. So you can get your education anywhere you wish to. If you want to go a studious line, go ahead, that's good. If you want to acquire other skills, go ahead, that's good. Parents today do a lot of homeschooling, not very popular in Sri Lanka, but elsewhere in the Western world. And there are successful uh, children, brilliantly brought up and uh, taught. Yes, there is a time you need technical skills, then you got to get that part done. But that's depending on what you want to do. So always remember education is just not going to school and passing exam. That is not education. If you don't know how to use your knowledge that you study in school, you have studied nothing. But it's the single best uh, investment in this day and age. You cannot become an IT professional if you don't have your exams, period. How could you tell something about chips to somebody if you have not, don't know what a chip is? How do you learn about the chip? Before you go and get an education. So your financial stability, your earning power, all will be dependent upon how skillful you are. Education does only stop when you are dead, when I am dead. Until then, you and I are continuously learning and students, students of God, students of our craft and careers. And remember, you young men know, today's phone is not <laughs> worth tomorrow. In other words, what am I saying? It's advancing and advancing. So as the world advances, careers and jobs get obsolete. A lot of people have lost their jobs in the present day age because of robotics. Robo is taking over the factories. A fork if goes in Amazon, takes the box of books, comes and places it on the order scale. No men there. People walk in, slide their credit card, orders, taps on something, credit cards get charged, product gets delivered, he goes off, even nobody will check it. In. That's the future. It already, it already happened in some parts of the world. What now if you are still carrying the box? What if you are a laborer? Go on home. I'm not running down a laborer. I'm not saying that thing. I'm saying that we have to advance with what is happening in the world today. That's why I, I encourage our senior ladies to get used to a laptop, to get you, you all, all of you have smartphones, but just don't use it just to take calls. Websites are there. If you go into the uh, uh, United website, sermons are there, Bible study there, family uh, guides are there. You can refer to other versions of the Bible. It's endless possibilities in this small phone that's in your pocket. If you only make use it, use make use make it uh, use it rightly. How about the older folks? How about the older folks? You can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? That's all false. That's not true. As I grew older in my company, I always sat by, beside my supervisor and he taught me a couple of things. I picked it up and, and began to perform with them. At 62, I'm always interested to learn something new. So should you. So dogs are smart people. When they hang around your home, they all the time keep learning about you. That's why they said that my 
pet did this and my pet did that. So all dogs can learn new tricks. <laughs> that, that's not true anymore. So you and I, all the people, must not stop learning either. Stability and strength. But I want to talk about self-discipline. Self-discipline. Please tell me the Proverbs chapter 25, verse 28. Solomon tells us that this sort of self-discipline is crucial if you want to succeed in life. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Whoever has no rule over his own spirit is like a city broken down without walls. Self-discipline, brethren, is crucial to maintain self-control over our personal lives. Solomon is saying, he, he, if, if you don't have cell phone, you're like a city broken down in walls. This city with broken walls. Formerly, there was a huge walls built to protect from the enemy. Either if, if they break it, have you have seen it in films and so on, the enemy takes over. Or you need to bribe your enemy outside not to come and take us over. Is that what you want to do? Therefore, you and I must discipline ourselves. Discipline our minds and hearts and bodies to the tune of God. It's not covered here, but you know God's commandments, statutes, judgments. Those are what we must instill in our personal lives if we want to be successful in all of these things that I'm talking about here. A person without self-discipline is unable even to control his own life, his own destiny. You can destroy your own life if you don't have self-discipline. Because you'll be doing, you'll be moving with every wind of doctrine, and you'll be doing everything that comes on onto your mind temporarily without any focus and, and going nowhere because you will be doing various things without no objective in your life. So the Christian must always have self-discipline. We must control our minds, our hearts, and guard our hearts against all unrighteousness. That's about Solomon has more to offer, but I want to go to Paul. Here's another biblical perspective from the Apostle Paul. Solomon was the only was not the only writer who talks about careers and jobs. The, the Apostle Paul did so. Please turn with me to Colossians chapter 3, verse 22 to 23. <laughs> Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleases. But in sincerity of heart, fearing God. Verse 23. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men. Colossians chapter 3, verses 22 to 23. Paul's instruction is very simple. We should approach our job as we are working for Jesus Christ. Period. Now, how would you do? How would I work if? If Jesus Christ asked me to do something for him, we will provide eye service for boss is watching, so I am working, and then boss takes his eyes off. And even if boss is not watching, brethren, youth, adults, God is watching. So he knows what you have done. So we have no way of doing injustice in our jobs. He says, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Not with eye service. He's talking about job. Okay, not doing anything and everything the employee says. We're talking of jobs here. Not with eye service as men pleasers. Don't try to please him, but with sincerity of heart, fearing God. If you and I fear God, you know the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, then we will act so 
in accordance with God's law in our employment. We won't, we'll have integrity. In other words, we will not cheat, we will not lie, we will not rob. We will do our very best for the money that we have earned. Brethren, not to be good employees is to dishonor God. That's what he's saying. But in sincerity of heart, fearing God, we must fear God in wherever we are, whatever we do, in school, in office, wherever. In other words, if we don't, the bottom line is, brethren, then you'll be stealing from the employer. You are a thief, unfortunately. Why? You agreed for a salary and joined the company to give, do this, this, and this, and you're not doing it anymore. What are you doing? You're being paid for something you are not performing. You are then, God calls a thief. You agree to a certain quantity and quality of service. If you will not give that to the employer for the salary you're getting, then you have not done your part and you have honestly disobeyed God. You are disowned God and disobeyed God because you are the child of God. What did Jesus Christ have to say? He asked the question, are you a profitable servant? Let's go to Luke chapter 17, verse 9 to 10 and see what he meant when he said these things. Luke chapter 17, verse 9 to 10. I think nowhere that we read express what Jesus Christ has to say. This is the best approach to a job. And of course, stated by your Savior and my Savior, Jesus Christ. He noted first the difference between a servant or an employee who is profitable and who is not. Luke 9, 17 verses 9 to 10. Does he, in other words, he is the master, thank the servant because he did the things that were commanded him? I think not. First thing, so likewise, when you have done all those things which you are commanded, say, we are unprofitable servants. We have done what was our duty to do. He doesn't, did the, after a good job done, did the master say thank you? Yeah, I don't think so. Why should he? He asked. Because when you have done all those things which you are commanded to do, you are still unprofitable. What is the point to us today? What is the point to us? You and I must go over and beyond what we are supposed to be doing. Because you are paid for eight hours, you put in the eight hours and go home. So you are paid for eight hours. No thank yous. You don't, you don't need any bonuses and you don't need any promotions because you are paid to do the eight hours work. Jesus Christ is saying, you shouldn't be thanked. Yep. Because you just did what you asked to do. That's why God said, delight yourself in the Lord and he will grant you the desires of your heart. Delight God. How do we delight God? Make him happy. That's not enough. We delight God by making him say, look at, at us and say, wow. Son, I didn't expect something to come out like this. Go on way and beyond keeping God's commandments and even surprising him occasionally. So the unprofitable servant, Jesus Christ said, he does not just, uh, he just barely meets his ex the expectation of the employer. You and I can't do that. We are supposed to go way and beyond. If you are to be profitable, then we must do what he, go way and beyond what he said. Brother, in times of economic uncertainty and financial instability that we are facing today, there is probably no better way to assure you employment and security and growth as to follow, follow Paul's admonition and Jesus Christ's teaching here that we just completed. If you and I can follow these principles talked about, talked by Solomon, taught by Paul and Jesus Christ. We fit the description of someone who is profitable, someone whom God is pleased with, and someone whom God can continue to bless. 
he will ensure our progress in life. Our progress in life, as we say, I'm talking of employment today. That's not progress in your entire life. I'm talking of employment, so we stick to that area today. But we want to be successful in our jobs. We want to be successful in our career. But God gave these advices thousands of years ago so that we can follow these things. Nothing of his word anywhere in the Bible is outdated. It, when it happened 4,000 years ago, it can happen right here in our, before eyes today. Therefore, we must be profitable servants. In conclusion, brethren, you probably have heard this before. Choose a job you love and you will never have to work a day in your life. Confucius. Yeah. Confucius is the Latin word of uh, this Chinese philosopher called Hong Fuzi. Hong Fuzi is the man who said this. Later in Latin, they translated as Confucius. Choose a job you love and you never have to work a day in your life. What's the point? Working in the place where you are happy, doing a job that you are very happy doing, have a significant impact on your personal life. So choosing the right job is so important. The job that you love, when you do that, you don't feel that you are being employed. You feel that that's what you're born to do. That's what you're good at. That's what you're best at. And you just, these things will out, come out from your personal life and you will be a happy person. If you pick a job that you don't like, you're of course going to be happy. Rather than life presents us with opportunities if we only seek for them. But these opportunities that you and I get must align with the values of God. I'm going to leave you with a question. How will our job, I'll ask myself again, our job or our career affect the priority God has given us? Matthew 6, 33. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Now, the question you will take with your home is, how is your job and career going to affect this? Think about it. It is through the job and career that you are going to make this change, make this move as long as you work and are employed in a company. How would you make your job be part of seeking first the kingdom of God? Would you be a soldier? What if there is war? Would you want to kill? Would you be an accountant and yet fiddle the numbers? Will you put integrity, truthfulness aside, break God's commandments? If you are a musician or in the music business or a DJ, will you sing or play songs that has good lyrics? What would you do if someone asked you to play a song that is not appropriate or sing a song that is not appropriate? What would you do at that point of time? I'm talking in terms of your job and seeking for the kingdom now. What would you do? Would you refuse or would you go along with it? Would you be then seeking for the kingdom of God through your job? This is not easy. This is not hard. I understand each person's situation and the jobs. But that's what we are called for. Our priority is seek first the kingdom of God and God said, I'll add the rest to you. He said, I'll add it to you. Don't worry about it. I understand you need this and I understand you need that. You're, I made you physical. You need to eat and drink and you need a job and you need a home and you need a wife and so on and so forth. He said, but I'm telling you, seek first my kingdom. So if you are working, how do I do it then? How do you do it? Therefore, brethren, your career and your job is so important if you are to remain Christian. If you are to remain a child of God, we must pick the, 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 the right job. I know it's the, jobs are difficult to come by. Nevertheless, would you choose a job because of the big salary and perks you are getting? Or would you choose a job or you take anything that comes your way just because you don't have a job? I know these are hard questions. But that's what God wants you to decide. But then whatever job you choose to do, God's commandments must be kept whilst performing your job. 
is told you, is set before you the royal law. We cannot be breaking any one of those. If we do, we need to repent and change and make those changes that are necessary that will be pleasing in his sight. It is going to be a daily challenge in whatever you do. Remember, being in the best job doesn't mean you are safe and sound. After signing, not to work on the Sabbath, I was asked to work on the Sabbath day. After signing, I could have taken him to courts. There's no point in that case. But if I did that that day, I would become a liar and I would have lost, they would have lost faith in me. So I went to give up my job and God didn't let that happen. In your life, in your careers, you're going to be tested day in, day out, morning and evening. You will be tested. Question is, how will you stand up? Would you ask for God's favor? Would you ask for God's help? And would you ask him to help you choose the right job? Doesn't matter how good the job is. Somewhere down the line, you'll be tested to keep God's commandments in your actions. Therefore, brethren, choose a job and career where you can perform in God's righteousness. Children, youth, adults, if you want to success, if you want, to, if you want success in your job, if you want success in your career, therefore, heed the wisdom of God that he just provided you for. There is much more you can learn. There is much more in the Bible. This is just a few things that I can share with you today. Yeah.